This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most bizarre, intense, sometimes humorous moments on the job. I am Steve Gould. Thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you for coming back and listening. Thank you for finding the show. If you're new to the show, happy to have you. Very bingeable. There's lots of episodes behind this one. Evergreen content. It's not uh, uh, news-based or anything. It's just uh, the men and women of law enforcement telling you the craziest experiences they've had on the job. And uh, the whole point is to get a better appreciation for what they're doing out there. And it's working. Um, Downloads are up. The show's doing really well. And I thank you all for that. I thank you to the Patreon subscribers, the people that really keep the boat afloat. They keep the money coming in. Thank you so much, patrolmen and sergeants, two different levels you can choose from. There's a link in the show notes for that. If you can't afford it right now, or it's not in the cards for you, not a big deal. The show will, of course, always remain free. So the maximum amount of amount of people can hear these unbelievable stories. So again, thank you for being here. I truly appreciate it. We got uh, one hell of a guest today. Um, got, I'm, I'm about to bring him on. He's done uh, 36 years and the last like 22 years were homicide. So the guy's got some stories. But before I bring him on, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of the show, officerprivacy.com. You can go to officerprivacy.com forward slash TPS uh, to sign up with them. Let's face it, guys, your information's all over the internet. Mine was too. It puts you at risk. Officer privacy helps you scrub your private information off the net so you and your family don't have have to worry about crazy people, criminals, people like that showing up at your front door. They're LEO owned and operated. I've spoken with the owner before. He's a great guy, and I can tell you he is really passionate about his business. He is doing, it is their mission to help officers take their privacy back, um, and it's an awesome company. I use the company, so I, I've i experienced their product, and it's really good. The customer service is top-notch, and like I said, they're just really good at what they do. Um, they'll send you an initial report, and it's all these databases where people are collecting your private information that's accessible to the public. And they'll give you a list, and then you get a second report, and it shows you that you've been scrubbed from all of them. And it is very satisfying to get that final list when you've been removed. It doesn't affect your social media if you have something going on uh, like that. It just is these databases um, on the internet that we are all on. And it's really, it's, it's shocking when you see how many you were actually on, and you need to get off. I know personally officers who have fell victim to their information getting out there because it was so easy to find. Uh, one guy even was stalked for like two years uh, by a, uh, a suspect uh, criminal, and it was scary. I mean, going by the house, um, threats to his wife. The guy ended up getting his wife a license to carry so she could defend herself when he wasn't home. He never wanted to go to work because she's home alone with the kids and the dog. So um, it's real, guys, and this is a really great way to defend yourself um, from having, from being found online. Well, let's face it, the climate's not good. So in the show notes, you'll see a link to officerprivacy.com, and you can go there. And besides that, it's a great product. You're showing your support for the show by supporting our sponsor. So go and check them out. All right, folks, happy to have them on board. Now we're going to talk about 36-year retired Seattle homicide detective. He did patrol, SWAT, sex crimes before moving to homicide and did 22 years there. He now owns a private investigation firm called Seamus Investigations. Also the author of Homicide, The View from Inside the Yellow Tape, and Seattle's Forgotten Serial Killer. I'm talking about no other than the great Cloyd Steiger. Sir, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure to have you, man. You've been on a lot of podcasts. I'm here. I'm on all the time. Yeah. It's like, it's almost something, it's almost like a part time <laughs> job, except I don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we sell some books. You know? There you go. Yeah. That's what I figured too. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So, <laughs> Seattle, man, you, you must be looking at Seattle now and being like, oh my oh. God. I mean, oh. what, let me ask you this. What is your, have you heard about this care unit they're making? It's like a, it's a division to law yeah. enforcement. I have heard about it. Yeah. Like I when I heard about it initially, 
my knee jerk reaction as a cop is I know what they're doing and I, I don't want it, but it sounds like if they're being honest in the press conference, it sounds like they're, they're still trying to get more cops or they're not reducing police. They want more still. And these are here to help police in addition to not to, not to reimagine, you know what I mean? My understanding of it is the patrol will go there first, assess the situation. And when they decide it's appropriate, then they'll call these people in. They'll come in and patrol will leave at that point. It's not like, going there in lieu of patrol officers. So, so once, once they establish the scene is safe, why tie up for p- patrol for an hour? They can right. leave. Yeah, yeah. They can tie, they can, they can go and uh, come in. We'll see. I mean, yeah, we'll see if right. it works. Yeah, I mean, because you, like like you know, you, you don't know if things are going to go wrong until they go wrong. You don't, yeah. You know, yeah. that's just the way it is. We have a program in the county I work in um, with clinicians, and it's been really successful, but they ride, we get an overtime shift like they're available for overtime. If you take uh-huh. one, you kind of run a certain part of the county with a clinician. So you only respond to mental health calls and you're kind of like her protection. Right, yeah. And there's still officers on in that town or city, but you're there in addition to. Right, yeah. But that's yeah. all grant money. You know, it's not like right, the... Yeah, exactly. Well, they have something, they've had something in Seattle. It's, it, wasn't, it wasn't, you didn't go with clinicians, but they had a unit called the Crisis Intervention Team, all made up of sworn officers who would respond to issues like this or if you had a problem child they would take take that and work it out you know and they had different training and stuff and you know they try all these different ideas we'll see if they work yeah it's really hard in a city like a major city like seattle or la or boston or new york it's i don't think people really understand um the call volume and the the beating back of the tidal wave that you're when you sign on shift and the board is stacked with calls um it, it I, I don't know. It's really hard to get ahead of it. When I worked at LAPD for the backgrounds unit, I would chat with the officers who were on on the road, and um, they try really hard. They're out there in the community weekly. Captains go to neighborhood meetings. Right, yeah. Like people don't realize you, big city cops are really trying. It's just yeah. not working. Right. Well, you know, in Seattle, nine one one is called about eight hundred thousand times a year in just Seattle. That's how many, wow. 800,000 people are calling 911 or calls are coming into 911. And those are, have to be responded to at some level or whatever. So, you know, it is hard. And that, now there's with a, kind of a mass exodus from the police department, they're down 40 or 45% in personnel. And that's a problem. Oh my goodness. Are they, um, are they offering like incentive bonuses now or anything to try to get people? Yeah, they do. But you know, I, uh, first of all, I had, I had two sons that were on Seattle. And they both left just recently. And it say the same thing. It ain't about the money, right? They make pretty good money. And although they're without a contract for like four or five years now. Right. And it's not, but it ain't about, it's about the political atmosphere. It's about the toxic atmosphere and people who know nothing about how to do police work, making decisions on how officers should do police work. That's the problem. And as long as that goes on, they'll never, they'll never get the, they say, we're going to hire, you know, 900 people next year. No, you're not. Because you every every month they have, you know, probably I don't know twenty or thirty people leave, and they make a big deal that they hired three people because that's all they can get. You know? oh, so you're yeah. you're negative every single time, and it isn't about money. No amount of cash is worth it. It's you know to go out there and have be second guessed and have people that want to prosecute you for doing your job. That's the problem, and that'll never change until that whole atmosphere changes. Yeah, I always get a little bit like when you hear admin staff at a place like Seattle the rhetoric they use, like when they start talking about, like they start talking about equity and inclusion. And yeah, you're like, exactly. You know, every cop on the road right now is rolling their eyes so, eyes so hard you can hear it audibly. It's like, yeah, guys, what are we doing? Yeah, you just, you know, get the bad guys and protect the good guys. That's that's what you that's what you do, you know? And, and most of the people that you deal with are the good guys and everybody realizes that, but you know, you got to take care of the bad guys because they're, and they're emboldened now because they think nobody will do anything about it. And the most part they're right. So they're out there doing more crime and, you know, Seattle's going to have more murders this year than they've probably had in their history because we're already almost up to the highest record number and we, it's only October. <laughs> you Jeez. Know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's like uh, murders are out of, out of control and, and violent crime is out of control. And as long as people keep electing people so far out of reality, this is going to continue. Yeah. How could it not? You're right. That's yeah. a good point you made about good people. Um, 
I used to work with, at uh, Backgrounds with the great Davis Cotto. He's come on the show twice. He's just a really funny, smart guy. And he right. was a homicide detective for L.A. And uh, I asked him one time about East L.A. because he was Hispanic and, you know, could speak Spanish and all that. Um, I was like, man, it's a rough neighborhood because I used to have to go there and knock on doors and do backgrounds. I was like, Jesus. Sure, yeah. And um, he's like, he goes, yeah, but you know what? Everybody there is pretty nice, actually. Yeah. I was like, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, you know what? Like he said, it's almost like, he said it might be as high as 95% of the people there. They want your help. Like they yeah, exactly. want the help, but they might be afraid. He said, right. but everybody I had a personal interaction with um, is a family or they, they really are kind and they want help right. and they're, they're not bad guys. But if you just drive through, you're going to get the mean mugging from the guys, the lookouts on the corners. And that's all right. you think of the place, yeah. you know? Yeah, I've been I, I've been to Southeast LA looking for murder suspects on my cases. So I've I've been in those cars and been in those neighborhoods. It's just, it's true though. I mean, it's like the the people that are trapped there because of financial, they can't move or whatever. Right. And they're and they have to live there, and they're the people that really appreciate when you take somebody down. Yeah. That's one left you have to worry about. They're trying to keep their kids out of gangs, keep them in schools. They're fa failing schools though, and they don't have any options. It's tough. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when dad's away working 18 hours a day. Yeah, he, he's exactly. not. It's almost like they don't have a dad. You know, it's it's yeah. really it's really rough. Exactly. Cloyd, can you take us in the wayback machine to <laughs> uh, when you were a young officer? Can a memorable early call you had a hot call that really got your blood going? Oh man! Well, first of all, I came on in November of '79. <laughs> That's the year I, I was born. Yeah, it was really, I had no just turned 21 years old, and I was I was I was the second youngest guy in the Seattle Police Department because there was a guy in my academy class two days younger than me. <laughs> I used to say, "Come on, kid, I'll show you the ropes." But anyway, <laughs> I got assigned. Uh, my first assignment was in uh, what was called the Georgetown Precinct back then. Uh, it was a it was an old precinct. It was uh, de it was decorated in early Barney Miller, and it was it had been a police station since like 1889 until it closed. That's awesome. I know, and but it was it, it was in a relatively high crime neighborhood. I worked eight at night to four in the morning, so all the good stuff was going on. A lot of a lot of shots, calls, and things like that. I normally worked a two man car car, but for whatever reason, one morning I was working by myself. My partner took the day off or something. And I was, it was like two o'clock in the morning. I was actually in the station for whatever reason. I'm just getting ready to go back up my car when a, the tones go off, beep, 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 you know, the alert tones, armed robbery in progress at, and it named this tavern that was only about a mile down the road from the station. And it's, and so I run out to my car and I jump in and I take off. And on the way there, they're saying, uh, description of the suspect. Now they said he's taking the bartender hostage. And a female bartender, they're, and then they're getting into a car. It's a Ford, whatever. I can't remember what kind of Ford. A brown Ford. And then, and as I'm ripping down the street, I'm almost there. And it says that, that the car is high centered on the uh, railroad tracks. And so I pull up. I see all these people outside. There, I see the brown cor Ford high, high centered on the railroad tracks. And a woman crying in the passenger seat. But the door, driver's door is open. Nobody in it. And everybody's pointing down the street. And I look to my left, and there's a, a street called River Street. And this guy is running down the middle of the street. So I get on my radio and I say, I got the suspect running southbound on river. Well, the problem is behind this tavern is a river. <laughs> and mm. so everybody thought I said running toward the river, but he's actually oh. running away from the river. And so I take off of my car and we go ripping, I go ripping down the street. Again, I'd been on the street like six months at this point. Wow. Uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. And he goes behind some bushes. And I, and, I, and I slam my brakes on my car and I, and I'm, and I, it's just like they, they tell you, you know, everything all of a sudden goes in slow motion. Mm -hmm. I can hear the radio operator saying, units use extreme caution, suspects armed and dangerous, blah, blah, blah. And as I go around, I'm kind of doing a, you know, a pie thing. on the Slicing bushes. the pie. Yeah, slice the pie. And I get to the end and there he is. He's standing there. He's got a gun in his hand. Wow. And it's pointed down and I'm dropping and I'm screaming at him, drop the gun, drop the gun. You know? And yeah. he's, it took a second and then he dropped the gun. And I went over and grabbed him, threw him down. And about that time, another car came by because they saw my lights and knew where I was. And they came and we took him into custody. And uh, it was a loaded 357 Magnum, but it, it was a, a revolver, but there was one shot fired out of it. But it was no shots were fired in this incident, right? So anyway, I should have shot the guy, first of all, because he could have brought that up and shot me before I had sure. a chance to react. Yeah, but I was, yeah, I thought, but I didn't shoot him. 
so we get him into the station and stuff and i'm doing all the work you know and it's, it's you know i'm about to have him taken downtown to jail and one of the guys that had been on the thing with me he said i just heard on the radio there was a murder out in maple valley which is an area in unincorporated king county 15 18 miles southeast of seattle in a bar and they said the guy was driving a brown ford and so i called oh. the sheriff's office and talked to the detectives and said, yeah the guy was in this bar blah 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 and he he, he shot the guy in the chest with a 357 and he was driving his brown ford and i said i think we have your guy in custody and it, it, it was him he had murdered wow. somebody earlier in the night. <laughs> yeah and and you know and matter of fact i remember walking up to him and i said at one point his name was richard sanford de shields i'll never forget his name he said you know how close I came to killing you? And he told me, maybe that's what I wanted you to do. <laughs> that's what he said. And, you know, he, he uh, yeah, he, he had killed somebody. And then whatever reason, on a chair, goes into Seattle and tries to rob a tavern at closing time. And so anyway, he got, he got taken down for it. But that was the first, you know, major call that and I went on hot calls all the time, first of all. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, there were shots fired every night and stuff going on. And yeah, but that was a pretty hot call. The first one that really comes to mind. Absolutely. So what was the ladies deal who was in the car crying? She was the bartender that he had taken hostage and, and he put her in the car and was trying to drive away with her, but he got high centered. So she was stuck there. So fortunately he didn't, when he ran, she just stayed in the car. That was her. Wow. Yeah. That's why did he, do you ever find out why he shot the guy? I have no idea why he shot the guy. Yeah. I, that was above my pay grade at that time. I just turned him <laughs> over to the county sheriff's detectives. <laughs> hey, you did the important part. You caught the guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, ab accidentally. I didn't know he was involved in a crime. But, yeah. You know. Well, we've all been in those situations before when you have a choice, you know, there, there's a use of force could, you, you had the right to do it, but you didn't, or you, you, right. you gave it a little bit more time. It's a very personal choice. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, because it's, it's easy to say he's holding a gun or, or he's not obeying commands, holding a gun, just shoot him. But right. you're taking, you're taking a life. So, I mean, right. Or, or well, not. Say, if that was me four years later, I'd have shot his ass. Yeah. <laughs> no question about it. No question about it. I'd have blasted yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can see the difference, in, especially in guys who do a career in big city policing, where, um, you know, I used to work with guys that shot four or five, six oh. people. Oh, yeah. Because they get to yeah, a point where they're like. Shot five people. When I was in homicide, he'd be shot five people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You get to a point where you're like, why am I going to it's not an even trade my life for theirs no it, it's not yeah we, we lose the ties that's right <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah. well that definitely is a, a hot call i i bet i bet working in the city in that size it was like a constant uh thing weekly people, I, I always hear these people saying i worked the police department 20 years and never drew my gun i said at the time at the time i remember saying well i worked this police department 10 years and i've probably drawn my, drawn my gun four thousand times <laughs> <laughs> I literally had, yeah. I've yeah. lost count. Yeah, I I used to work with the guy who was a good friend of mine at, at Backgrounds, and um, he worked a robbery table for um, or gang table for years as like a D two, and um, he was like one of the few people around that had never shot anybody. Oh yeah, um, stuff and robbery. Yeah, and he had done. He said, "I oh, he goes. There was so many instances where it almost happened, but didn't. Right. Drew's gone a million times." And he, he said, like, I almost feel guilty. He's like, because every, he's like, everybody else is shooting people, the bad yeah. guys, you know, righteously. And he goes, right. but I never really, I never had to. And he's like, I'm, right. he's like, he's like, I'm thankful for that. He was a Christian, you know, so he was thankful he didn't right, have to right, take yeah. a life. But um, yeah, he did feel like that pressure, like Jesus, yeah. you know, he just got lucky. One of my sons was in a shootout in Seattle a couple of years ago it was, and ended up killing the guy. And it was, it was a good shoot and everything, but it's, yeah, and he, he, he had like, well, uh, eight 10 11 years on when he did it but you know that was a homicide suspect too he didn't know it at the time but he just killed somebody and he drew down on them and fired at the, at the officers and then uh everybody shot back so yeah did what they had to do let me ask you do you as a um as a father now of uh sons that are cops or do you does it make you lose sleep do you get worried i no. my wife used to i'm a father of sons who used to be cops because they both left <laughs> oh they didn't transfer out they just left they, yeah they left well my son his wife has a really successful uh career and makes tons of money so oh, god bless him that. yeah and then my other son he's uh he's doing like dignitary protection stuff and executive protection stuff with a bunch of other ex-cops and that's what he's doing right now but yeah no they both they didn't they didn't neither one of them changed departments they just left 
Wow. All right. So that, that, that worries off the table for you. Then. Yeah, exactly. Especially someone who did the job as long as you, you would know right. exactly what they're facing every night. That, that yeah, would, you that... know, one of my jobs was investigating officer involved shootings too. So I've investigated like 50 officer involved shootings, you know, so that, and so I know what's going on with that and, and, uh, stuff. It's all different now. Of course they have all these, because it, you know, when I did it, homicide did it and they have all these people that are, that, that, that's like you're accused of something when you should get in a shooting. Now, before it was an administrative investigation, unless something showed it shouldn't be, but it's a lot different now. So. Yeah, I'm surprised that the ma- major cities are even allowed to. I- I'm surprised they haven't forced major liberal cities to farm it out to, like, the sheriffs. You know what I mean? Like, well, they I'm tried su- that, but the problem is they tried that for a while, but Seattle gets in too many shootings. The sheriffs, they, they didn't want to handle that. <laughs> we got other stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, we got other stuff to do. And so they they have all these layers and, you know, uh, don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you're out of that world now, brother. You're doing yeah. good. yeah. <laughs> Uh, Cloyd, can you t- describe a strange or bizarre thing you dealt with in your career? Oh, my God. I've dealt with so many bizarre things. Oh, I can uh, imagine. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, because I did, like, I did sexual psychopath murders. I did, you know, you know those type of things. And, of course, sex yeah. crimes. Yeah, you know, all kinds of things. And sex crimes. Se- sexual psychopath. What does that involve? You know, oh, yeah. Rape and murdering women. You know, that type uh. of thing. And Yeah torturing Ooh. women before they make rape them and yeah that type of stuff so that those are all bizarre i mean i had uh uh let me think of a bizarre god there's so many it's just hard to choose one <laughs> i mean because i mean it's a it's being a, a, a homicide detective especially in a major city is a lot different than working other places because the stuff you see i always tell people when guys came on i said you'll see more in two years than most other people will see in their career yeah you know, the, stuff going on you know i mean this uh i remember uh uh i mean I, this it wasn't really bizarre but i mean i had this it's kind of a funny story too but we got my partner and i got called to this dead body on the side of the road and it's it was in an area of seattle it's west seattle it's called it's it's across the bay from downtown and that area has beautiful views of downtown seattle across the bay so the houses are three million, four million dollar houses and stuff and condos. And this body is some some found by the side of the road and he's been shot in the head. And long story short, we were working the case and we, you know, we didn't really have much to go on because it was a body dump. He wasn't killed there, it was a body dump. But I get a tip about somebody that may have been involved in the uh, in the murder. I get a call and, this, and the caller says, This guy, Jose, let's say he was Mexican. I think his name was Jose, I don't know, something like that. He was he, he was spraying out using one of those spray car washes three o'clock in the morning that day and I, you know, I told my partner yeah this guy was he's, he knows this guy and he was spraying his car at one of those you know self-help car washes and my partner says well there's nothing unusual about that I said yeah but he was spraying out the inside of the car Ooh. oh that's interesting so we figure out who he is he works on uh, a fish processing boat down where uh, a fisherman's terminal where a lot of the, the uh, boats from de- deadliest catch and stuff go out of and so we go there when he's working one day and going to his place and uh he's in there and i go jose talk to, we need to talk to jose they bring him into the room and i go do you know pedro he goes yeah i know pedro and you know he died yeah i heard i heard do you know anything about it no i don't know anything about it and i said yeah, is your car here yeah it's out in the parking lot can we go out and look at it yeah yeah and we go out to look at it you know and he opens the driver's back door and opens the door on the side and it's all clean inside you know I go, let's go on the other side of the car okay so he opens the other side of the car and between the seat and the door is a hunk about this big of a human brain. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, Lucy, you got some splaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> of course he didn't get it, but that was, and that was because he had shot and he cleaned it all out, but he forgot about opening the other side because the brain was still there in the car. Part of it anyway, big chunk. And you know, Wow. Yeah. I mean, that was, and then, you know, like I had serial killers, we had, we had a guy who was killing prostitutes and, you know, he used to, he'd take it. There was an area called the jungle in Seattle and it's this, it's owned by the department of transportation that parallels inter, interstate five and interstate 90 where they meet in downtown, right by the baseball and football stadium. Anyway, prostitutes were ended up being found up there, tied up and murdered, you know, and long story short, we got this guy and we're talking to him. His name was Dwayne. I go, Hey, Hey, Dwayne. Why do you take him up underneath the, once he finally confessed, why do you take him up underneath the, uh, the freeway there? And he looks at me, he goes, 
because nobody can hear him scream up there. <laughs> oh <what> he... <laughs> my gosh! Yeah, and he was a, and you know he, he had, and he talked about one of his, one of his uh, victims. He was describing how he's luring her to this spot. He was trying to find this spot, and he went behind this warehouse, and he said, and then once he got her in there, he was started to choke her, and she said, "Don't do this! Don't do this! I got babies!" And he goes, I, he says, "I didn't want to hear that shit." I said. You tell it to Jesus when you see me in a minute. And I choked her ass out, her eyes bulbs out, and she pissed herself. And then I knew she was dead. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's wow. just a day of this, by the way. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. What, what is, I don't know if you got too much into this, but you must have because you tracked these people, tried to find yeah, them. Right. I mean, the idea to someone who's relatively normal like me, um, that doing that to a woman would give you a bony baloney like that would that that would get you excited so is it is it i mean is it just the old classic this guy was abused as a youth bad upbringing or is it like a? that's the big question nature and nurture right i mean it's it's i think it's a little of both you have to have that propensity and then if you you know they they, i have a lot of friends who are criminologists they've studied this you know they're not cops but they're criminologists and we talk all the time over beers and you know these these babies that are left and they and lift in their cribs and they cry and cry and cry and there's nobody there to calm them down. They have to sell. That kind of is the one of the track things on psychopaths and and then uh, self soothing. Self soothing, yeah. It's because you ever watch if you ever see a baby. There's a, a clip I see all the time. I think on Instagram, of this baby. He's so cute. He just got his little lip stuck and he's starting to cry real bad. And the mom just comes up, gives him a couple kisses on the cheek and suddenly he's like. He's fine because right. <laughs> he has that, but they didn't get this. So they're sitting there left for hours. And, and that and matter of fact, this guy, actually, uh, one of my friends who's a uh, criminologist. Yeah, she lives in Wales. But we were talking about this a long time ago when he goes, man, if I ever come to Seattle, let's go see that guy. I said, OK. And he did. He came to Seattle. So I said, set up. We went to the prison. We talked to him. This is 20 years after the event. Yeah. And he said he's and he was doing a my, my buddy was doing it unofficial psychopathy exercise to see if he's a psychopath. And when we're done, he said, he's definitely a psychopath. But the things this guy said, he claimed a lot of things. One of the things he said is, he said, uh, well, well, the funniest thing he said to me was, well, the serial killer thing didn't end up being as glamorous as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah. Then, he wants he a said, Netflix special. Yeah. Well, my, uh, and then he says, my daughter asked him, Daddy, why you do this stuff? And I said, I don't know. I guess I just got something loose in my head. That's what he said. Yeah. So. Oh, well, that's for he, sure. He understands. Yeah, he claims that his dad was a mortician and he would do things with the bodies in the house. I don't know if that's true or not. You know, but he did. You know, the, the difference when he was he was confessing to this crime, he, he he cut himself on one of them, and he had to take a bus to Portland because he didn't want to go to a hospital in Seattle. So he's down there, and he, and, and so he said he had some one of his his brother in law or somebody take him to the bus station. So we went to talk to his brother in law. And he goes, do you remember? Yeah, Dwayne got hurt. And he had me get him to the bus station. Did he tell you what happened? Yeah, he said he killed somebody. He said, you didn't think you should call the police or something? Oh, no, no. He tells me he kills people all the time. <laughs> that was no big deal to you. Yeah, that was no big deal to this guy. <laughs> the brother-in-law. Oh, my <laughs> oh, no. gosh. Yeah, so that's, so, that's what you're dealing with. You know, that's the thing. Total disregard think, for human life. Yeah, none. They think, I always say, serial killers think of their victims like you would if you're drinking a can of pop and throw it in the garbage afterwards. They have as much empathy for that victim as you have for that can because it doesn't, it's just an object. It's nothing yeah. for them. Yeah. Yeah. They always say, you always hear that like the, uh, a lot of the serial killers they've examined like would um, hurt animals, cute young animals. Yeah, right. yeah. Like they don't have that empathy. They just don't care. They don't, have any they don't care. That's no matter of this guy. There's, there's, if you, if you run Dwayne Lee Harris, D E W A Y N E Lee Harris on, on, uh, in YouTube, there's a video of him. And he was interviewed by a local news station when, but when he after he got arrested but before trial, and he says, "What did he say? Do I have? Do I feel bad that these women are killed? No, I don't." <laughs> he says, "It clears about no, I don't. I don't feel bad." So he, wow. he just talks all about it. Yeah, he's a, he was a piece of work. Wow. But, that, yeah. And that thing you said about the self soothing made me feel better because um, when we we have three children, the youngest is three. And when we had the first one, the big thing was let them cry it out. Right. Yeah, exactly. And my wife immediately, probably like every woman feels inside, right. said, this feels wrong and I'm not doing it. Yeah. And I, and I said, okay, but, well, I'm, I said, I'm not going to, at the time I was like working overnight. So I'm like, I'm not going to get up 
like, you know, when the kids take a nap during the day or what I, I can't be getting up. So it's going to be all on you. If you're going to, if, if we're going to go down this path and the kid's going to cry all the time. So what she found in the research and she like really went deep on it was that, um, most moms are like encouraged to have the kid in the room with them for the first six months to a year close. Right. Because yeah. that's that's normal for human physiology. Right. Like to, right. a baby shouldn't wake up and go because they're, yeah. they're so yeah. defenseless. So we right. we ended up by the third kid. We ended up with a crib that goes level with the bed and can actually swing over the bed. Right. Yeah. Um. And we did it with all three kids. They were in the room to about a year old, and it worked great. They slept soundly. They we right. we did not have to get up a lot. Right. But but there's yeah, there's definitely cool. that. You know how trends go, you know? Right, yeah. Sure. Like, let the kid cry it out or else they'll never right, be yeah. capable themselves. Totally not yeah. true. No, it's not. Yeah, especially when they're little like that. When they get a little older, you can be a little, you know, but but you right. still got to, it's still at the end, you got to re reassure them so they don't become psychopaths and stuff. But you know, <laughs> yeah. like reassur reassurance helps them a lot in development. So that's the things you got to look at. Yeah, I don't want my three-year-old being like, someone turned the puppy's head around. Be like, yeah. <laughs> we got a problem. Yeah, no kidding. Damn. Uh, um, Cloyd, can you tell us about one of your most intense or terrifying calls you went on? Oh, my God. Intense or terrifying? Well, you know, the thing about the I always tell the people this, too. They're not terrifying when you do it. They're terrifying when it's all over and you realize what just happened. Right. You know, when you're doing it, it's just you're in that zone, right? It's going, I mean, I, I, when I was patrol officer, I, my partner and I would pull up on shooting stuff going and bullets flying all around us, right? Was I scared? No. Afterwards, I went, holy shit. But, you know, at the time, I wasn't scared just because you're in that mo in that zone, you know, you're thinking. Adrenaline's you know, pumping. Yeah, adrenaline's pumping. You're not, and you don't realize that stuff. I mean, I, geez, I went after, I mean, once I was, this is not kind of funny. We, my partner and I were looking for, a witness in a murder we're investigating. We went outside the city to an address in, a, in the county, about 10 miles south of the city limits. And it was like, you know, first in the mo first thing in the morning, dopamine time. So it's about noon. <laughs> right. I'm going to this house looking for this guy who might be a witness. And there's all these people laying on the floor asleep. You know, I'm like, and I'm knocking on the door. And finally, I, I open the door a little bit and, and everybody, everybody's laying there looking up at me. And I get hanky and I, I pull my gun up. Every one of them has got like an AK under the blanket with them, right? All of them. And wow. I didn't realize these, these are bangers, right? I wasn't looking for a banger. So I went and we're on the phone because I didn't have a radio because I'm outside calling for, for to send people and they did. Nobody did anything. And we hooked all these people up, but we were so we were so busy with our murder that we just hooked them up, identified them and sent them out the door. We'll deal with the guns. And they were happy as shit. They didn't get charged with that because they all had AKs and stuff all over the place. And it was just my partner and I. With, with you know i glock you know but not and i'm like holy shit that was that was a, a a nut twister a little bit but i mean it wasn't yeah. <laughs> when you realize you can step right into something like that when you accumulate that many experiences that many intense experiences like that did it ever build up did it ever make you have trouble sleeping or were you good at just shutting it off no i was yeah i've always said that i i was made for this because it's just like water on back stuck it just rolled off me you know i not that i don't what i would what i would be I would wake up in the middle of the night sometimes thinking about a really important case, thinking, I need to do this, you know, and, and that type of thing. But I wouldn't, you know, I didn't crawl into a bottle or doing that stuff. I had, you know, I had a lot, I just, it just is part of the job. I had a, I had a, a power takeoff lever between home cloid and work cloid. <laughs> <laughs> I could do that. And not that I didn't think it worked when I was home, but it, I didn't let it absorb my life. Yeah. So that's probably, I mean, that's probably a, so you had a gift for it. That's probably kind yeah. of a kind yeah. of a rarity. Yeah, you have to. You have to. I mean, first of all, when you're really in intense in these things, you're not home, right? I'm working thirty hours straight. I'm coming home for four or five hours sleep, going right back. So you don't really have that once. But once you're there, I don't. I once it was time to go home. I mean, I, I one one. I, I was asked this case about this case a long time ago. Speaking of intense cases, where uh, I was home at like summer afternoon at five o'clock and my phone rings and it's one of the homicide sergeants said are you available i wasn't on call yeah what do you got and he goes well some guy went crazy with a gun in, in a house and he shot a bunch of people and the officers got there and they got an officer ball shooting and we got multiple dead yeah so i go down there to this house in rainer valley and it was a beautiful summer afternoon and when i get there you know there's helicopters in the air and there's this 
the chief of police is standing there with all these news people around him and, and, and nobody had been in the house yet. I was the first detective to get there. So this guy had he'd be, been, been shermed up, you know, and he, and he was like a 20 year old guy and he just started beating and shooting people in his own family. And then he went outside and the officers came up, pulled up because they got called there for the disturbance and he had a gun and they blasted him. He's dead on the sidewalk there. And I go inside and there's a, like a 19 year old kid laying sideways dead on the couch. I go around the corner. There's like an 18 month old that's been beat to death laying on the floor. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And there's blood everywhere. There had been a, a little four year old girl that had been stabbed like 20 times in the bathtub, although she was still alive and was taken away before I got there, but blood all over the wall. She ended up surviving. Somehow. Wow. And then, and, and, uh, and so th- that, that was an intense call. I mean, that's, that's an intense scene. And at the end, you know, the guy's dead. So there's not, there's nothing going on, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't, there's no investigation. I mean, this guy's just, just to happen. Yeah, they're just following protocol at that point, calling you there. Yeah, just, 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 yeah, getting the scene done. There was another one also like that. It was, this was in West Seattle with a uh, Vietnamese family. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning on a weekday. Um, multiple people shot, multiple people down. We get up there. And what had happened is that the grandmother, this, it was multi generations living in this house, and the grandmother was mentally ill. And, and apparently, something called chromophobia is what I was, that was the first time I ever heard that certain huh. colors set her off. And so for whatever reason, somebody, she saw a certain color and she got access to a gun and she started shooting everybody. And, you know, she killed her own family. And, you know, and the one thing it was, there were dead kids here, dead parents there, dead extended family. And, there seven, and then she shot herself in the head at the end. But one of the things, there was a little uh, six-year-old girl who was supposed to go to school that day, but she was homesick. And when this started happening, her brother and sister shoved her out the front window. And she didn't know when I was talking to her that her brother and sister were both killed. Oh. And, you know, and I'm interviewing, I'm talking to her and she tell, me, tell me what happened. And she's just as cutest little, sweetest little thing. And she goes, most of the time, my, my grandma comes home and tells me good morning. But this morning she came home and shot my daddy in the head. You know, <laughs> that was what she oh said. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. All of her family was killed. She was the only survivor. And her brother, she said, my brother, and she said his name, he pushed me out the window, my sister, but she didn't know then they were dead inside. So it was just a, and it was just one of those crazy scenes. Wow. That's insane. Cloyd. Yeah. I, I don't I know. Have, I haven't seen much. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> those are only a couple off the top of my head. That's why I wrote a book. <laughs> wow, man. No. That's but, intense. Do you have, um, in all the murder investigations you did, do you, do you have, um, like a notal someone of notoriety or or a, or a memorable investigation that you did that was like you know well, really stands like out. Yeah, I mean, well, I got I got I had a case once where uh, Ann and Nancy Wilson of Hart were being stalked by this guy, and they were out of town, and he broke into Ann Wilson's house and caused all kinds of damage, and and you know, and and he got arrested by patrol. I went to talk to him. He's a short little guy with long hair and a big beard and crazy. He looked like Charlie Manson. Mm. And he was telling me that he was Nancy Wilson's uh, illegitimate son. You know, I interviewed Ann and Nancy both. Ann was like nine years older than him. And so, you know, and the thing about that was so I did it and he got put away for stalking. But then several years later in homicide, uh, I got called to the Seattle Center, which is the area where the Space Needle is. Some old woman was walking across the grounds and some guy just came up and plowed into her and rammed her head into a wall and killed her. And it was the same guy. He'd gotten out and they just crazy, you know, just absolutely crazy. So they were the ones that the famous people. I mean, wow. That's, an, do you have a, um, a particular homicide investigation that was like memorable to you? Like, like, like till to this day, you still think back on sometimes and go, wow. Well, I have a lot of those, but the one that really sticks out was, uh, was, uh, Halloween night, 2009. My, my, we were over, I was off and, my son and his wife and kids and in-laws are all here. And my oldest grandson was like three months old. So they took him to show the neighbors. And then and my oldest son had to go to work. He was working third watch in the East Precinct of Seattle, which is eight at night to four in the morning. And about 10 o'clock at night, my, my, my cell phone, work phone rang and it was a sergeant. And he said, we got shots fired an officer down at 29th and Yesler. Well, 29th and Yesler is right in the middle of the precinct where my son was working. Right. And so I'm like, Oh shit. So, I said, I'm on my way. And so I start to walk out and my wife's going, what's going on? Did you get called in? Yeah, I got called in. What is it? It's an officer fellow shooting. She goes, where? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> and I, and I, just at that moment, my phone rang again and it was my son. And I answered and he goes, 
I'm there, dad. He's dead. He's dead. The officer. And so mm. I said, oh, man. So I tell them, my officer has been shot and killed up at, in East Precinct. And they all start crying. And I ripped up there and, and went up. He'd been ambushed, you know, and, and it was a long, intense case. I mean, the, the first thing, again, I get there and there's 75 patrol cars in the area scouring for this guy. I bet. Helicopters in the air. Um, you know, and I walk up and I, at the first, mostly, I don't know most of these officers, right? Now, most of the time when it seems I didn't know these guys. And I said, who, who was it? And he goes, Tim Brenton. And I, and I didn't know Tim Brenton, but I go, is he related to Boyd Brenton? He goes, that's his dad. Well, Boyd was an old patrol officer when I was a young patrol officer. So I'd worked around his dad and I go, oh shit. So I walk up, I mean, they go up there, there's a patrol car and it's all surrounded by yellow tape and stuff. And there was all this noise. And I always say when I ducked under the yellow tape, it's like I was in the cone of silence because everything was quiet. And I just walked up and I looked in and there's on the pasture side is Tim Brenton, the officer. And he'd been shot. He hit four times in the head with an AK, oh, with a, a AR-15. And I remember standing there looking and I go, and I, I, I remember thinking to myself, Jason, my partner, Jason and I, are gonna, are the, it's our responsibility to get the fucker that did this, right? Mm. <laughs> and it was like, man. So anyway, it was from that night on, it was... Uh, 18, 19 hours every, every single day. That was a Sunday. And then the, his, Tim's funeral was on Friday. And, you know, I, I, I didn't go to the funeral. I stayed to work. And, and, but my partner did and some other people went. <clears throat> and right in the middle of the funeral, an intelligence detective was on me. He goes, he goes, cause I, we, we'd gotten, uh, we'd figured out the suspect vehicles. We found them on dash cams coming from the scene because we had one witness that saw it described what the vehicle looked like to begin with. It was a long, long story, but we had, and so Wednesday we released to the news still shots of the suspect vehicle. So on Friday, this uh, intelligence detective, Tim Renan comes and goes, Hey, Cloyd, I got this woman who, who's an apartment manager and she, and she's, uh, she's, I've been working with her on an unrelated case, but she says she's got a guy that lives in her place and he's got a car just like that. And just since yesterday, he put a car cover over it. And I went, what? Ding, 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 ding. You know, that's yeah. why you look. Why would you, it's, first of all, it was a piece of shit, 1982 Datsun. Why are you putting a car cover over this, right? So right. I'm, I'm stuff and I, I, I tell a couple guys, go down there and send in this car. I'm going to get a warrant. Okay, they take off. And I'm there getting a the warrant and trying to type up the warrant to get out there. All of a sudden, we got shots fired at that scene at the house, at the Tuckwell. So they ends up, he walked up on them. They said, we need to talk to you. He pulled a gun. Shots were fired. Boom, 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 boom. He was hit twice, once in the face and once in the chest, but he was, he wasn't killed, but he was paralyzed. And so, Good. and then we got, then we, by, by that, by the time I walked into his apartment for the first time, it was three o'clock in the morning because all the thing, his apartment we had been booby trapped with, with bombs and all this other stuff and trip wires. And wow. he, before, the, before the shooting, he'd done, he had, he had, gone to the city shops and he lit one of the big mobile precincts on fire or mobile command posts. And then he had delayed fuse pipe bombs underneath other police cars. So when the officers pulled up, cars started blowing up all around him. It was an intense case. And, that, wow. and we got, that, we got that guy that night. And, and that's the most, in, you know, that one that stands out the most to me, you know, that I had primary responsibility for. Wow. That's intense. Man. Much longer than that, of course, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. Um, what was his deal with police? Did he just hate he authority? Just, yeah. He, and it, you know, he had a, he had a, uh, a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and he couldn't was, get on the job. Yeah. And he, no, he never, yeah, he couldn't get on. And, and you know, the, the other car he drove, he drove this piece of shit Datsun 82 Datsun, but the other car he drove was an ex police car Crown Victoria. Right. So he'd been, yeah. And he'd, he went. I talked to some of his old professors and stuff. He said he was just not right. The boy won't write. Yeah, you know? he he had, he did it. He had all this stuff on his computers about finding Seattle police, where they eat, this that. But they also had LAPD. You know, he'd gone and he actually knew. We knew he'd gone down to LA, so we were asking, "Do you guys have any?" I called down there. There until just, oh my god, no, we didn't everything like that. But he he thought about. It. He probably just cowered it out. He was just a nut. Wow, that's he scary. He killed, in prison. he killed himself in prison. So. Good. <laughs> it sounds like he was obsessed with the police, and he kind of, was. Yeah. He felt rejected. He couldn't be one. Yeah, and then he got into this whole jury nullification shit, and you know his mother was a prostitute, his dad was a pimp, and oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, there you uh, go. That's right. I, I, yeah. Ideal childhood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Damn. 
Cloyd, can you tell us about a, a positive or heartwarming encounter you had on the job? Well, yeah, the one I would, the, well, I had a lot of those too, but the one I always talk about was when I was a sex crimes detective, there was a little four-year-old boy that got kidnapped and raped by a door-to-door salesman. And he was a sweet kid and we had this whole thing, went to a terrible trial. He tested around on his fifth birthday. He was just a champ. Oh. We went through it. Yeah. He was just right up there. He said, he was missing it. First thing he goes, he, he asked me if I wanted to see some puppies even from Scotland. And so anyway, long story short, we, we go through this long thing. He gets convicted. The guy gets convicted. Move on. The boy was from Scotland or the, or the abductor? The boy was from Scotland. His family had moved here because they were fishermen to go to work at the fisherman's terminal. Oh, to go on okay. fishing boat. And he was cute. Yeah. Anyway, so four years ago, five years ago, I get a message on Messenger. It says, you probably don't remember me, but when I was a little boy, something terrible happened. And you really helped me out. And, you know, I just I, I just got the case file. And I, I'm just wanted to tell you thank you. And so he's a... I'm married with a family of my own now and all that stuff. And we became Facebook friends and we still are. And so that was something, you know, you don't, you just move on to the next one, but he, 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 not for him, you know, it's, it, for him, it was a big deal. And of course, and so, yeah, that, that, that made me feel good that he reached out to me. A year, I was gone. I was already retired from SPD when he, when he uh, reached out to me. So, yeah. Yeah. That's great that <clears throat> he um, sounds like he has recovered and is living a oh, good yeah. life. And oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. That's great, man. Cloyd, um, a popular question that I ask is um, advice for new candidates. A lot of a lot of people thinking about being cops or or in backgrounds, they're in the process. Um, they love to hear you guys tell these stories. What advice would you give to a new candidate? You, you know, it's so hard now because it's not the same place it used to be. First of all, go to some place that supports the cops. And loves yeah. the cops. Don't go to some place that hates the cops. I mean, I decided I wanted to be a police officer when I was ten years old, and I never changed. So I know that that's like you know, if, if there were these podcasts when I was a kid, I'd have been all over them. Right. You know, they're all these shows, none of because I'd read all the nonfiction books about being a cop, and I that's what it, you know, I decided then that's what I was going to be. And I never wavered. I, I went to school to criminal justice, and then, I mean, right at my I was twenty and a half, and I picked up the phone and said, "It's called the Seattle Police Department because I wanted to work for a big department." Are you guys hiring? They go, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, we are. And they sent me a packet and I went to a test where like, it was a two day test and over two days, like 2000 people took this test. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm not going to get hired. And I got a card in the mail, you're number 13. And the next thing you know, I went, I was hired, you know, and I, and I loved it. And it was a great career. I had a great time. We can only hope that the pendulum has swung so far one way that it's going to start coming back the other way because people are getting tired of living with crime out of control and all this other stuff. And there are cities and places around this country that support the police. And you got to find one of those places. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. And, and get a good job. I had a great, I can never say, Oh, I'm sorry. I did it. Cause I had a great career. The police department was good to me. Yeah. It, it made me who I am today, you know, and I, and I, and I got all this other stuff. going. So, I mean, just best of luck. First of all, you, you should, if, if you, if you're not, if you don't have some weird thing wrong with you, you shouldn't have any trouble getting a job. That's the good news. Yeah. They can't, yeah they're taking 2,000 people testing. They're probably lucky if they get 20 people testing in a test today. Yeah, yeah. it used so, to be really, really hard to become a cop. It used to be really hard, yeah. And and that's good and bad. It's, I mean, you, it's it's good because you get the best of the best. But, you know, a lot of these – I get calls a lot of time for people. You know, I'm not, I, I'm not telling people I wouldn't be a cop if I were you because I, that would be kind of hypocritical of me. Right. But, make sure you're in the right place in the right city with the right political atmosphere. Yeah. Maybe go to Florida. They yeah. Uh, yeah, good. sure. I mean, yeah. There's a lot of good places in Florida. It's hot, but <laughs> yeah, it's hot, yeah, and muggy and hurricanes, but other than Texas, a lot of good places in Texas. Yeah. You know, heck yeah. Don't go to Austin. But <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Cloyd, yeah. what, what do you do to unwind? What's a hobby of yours you enjoy doing? Well, I, I have six grandkids. I like playing with my grandkids. I go to their baseball games. I go to their soccer games. Nice. Uh, I read a lot. I still write from time to time. Um, you know, I just hang out, you know. That's great. I, yeah. You ever go shooting? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, well, I keep my Leosa, so I have to go shoot at least once a year for that, you know. Right. But, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I just went in August, and that was fun. It was fun because not only was it fun, because in Seattle, they do it when they're doing regular quals. 
So you see a lot of guys you haven't seen in a long time, you know, Heck a lot yeah. of new guys that look at you like you're a dinosaur, you know, because you've never seen them before. I mean, when I was the last 10 years when I was a homicide detective, I would get called to a scene and pull up and not know any of the officers that are there, <laughs> maybe not know any of the sergeants, and sometimes not even know the lieutenant. You know? <laughs> it's like, they were probably like, oh, it's Cloyd. Yeah, yeah, yeah no <laughs> kidding. No. Yeah. That's great, man. Do, do you guys have like um in your area, do they do a like a pancake breakfast or anything, the retired guys? Oh, we got well, first of all, yeah, I go. There's a very active retired uh, thing. There's called the Retired Seattle Police Officers Association here. Oh, good. They have a yearly big banquet, monthly meetings, and I go to one. What's called RAP, RAP uh, Retired and Active Police. It's a meeting and a lunch every Thursday, and I try to go every Thursday. It's a big. There's a big retiree uh, community here, and it's great because you know people don't miss the job; they miss the people usually. So. We still hang out. We're in, I'm in contact. We have our own Facebook page for uh, for Seattle area cops, and so we do a lot of stuff on that. And and so yeah, we st- I stay in a lot of contact with a lot of retired guys. That's great. You yeah. know, I feel like when I was a kid in the '80s, my dad was a cop. He ended up being a cop like 32 years, and I feel like the camaraderie and the cops like were the families were a lot closer than they are now like it feels like that's like kind of falling away from police work in a way which is we were always at seattle was always good about you know having social events for cops and you go to one they have a big christmas party where all old retired guys and active guys all go with their kids and grandkids and stuff it's a big thing and i just I, i just i just went to a a friend of mine retired 80th birthday party on saturday you know and so a lot of retired guys there and and, you know, we hang out, like I said, every Thursday, I, I, I go to this thing and there's probably, there's usually 30 people there every Thursday, not always the same ones. And, and then once a month we have the big meet, bigger meetings and, you know, we get together a lot, socialize a lot otherwise. And so, yeah, I'm in contact with a lot of retired people and a lot of active, well, my son's friends that are still active. I mean, right. one of my, one of my oldest son's former partners, always, he doesn't live far from me. And he comes over and goes, Hey. If I come over, will you make me a Bloody Mary? Yeah, come on over. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm glad you're keeping that connection. Oh, Cloyd, yeah. tell us about the uh, the books you've written. Well, the first book I wrote was The Homicide, The View from Inside the Yellow Tape. And that was the one where everybody, when I'd tell these kind of stories, would say, oh, man, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. And so I finally did. And I put it out. And, you know, I didn't think of much, but it's it's selling a lot. I mean, it's, it's, it's been great. Selling, selling. Matter of fact, I, Joseph Wamba told me he bought my book, which is Joseph Wamba, former LAPD guy that wrote The Onion Field and all that stuff, which was kind of yep. cool. And then the other one, I was working after I left Seattle. I worked for the attorney general's office for a while. I was a chief criminal investigator of what was called the Homicide Investigation Tracking System, which is a we track all the homicides in the state and then help agencies, small agencies, you know, coach them when they have these things. And, and after I wrote my first book, I got a message from somebody goes hey what do you know about gary grant and i go who's gary grant oh he was a serial killer was killing people in this area in the late 60s early 70s i never heard of him so long story short i tried to find out him for the for the hits job and i know the agencies that handled it it was it was king county sheriffs and renton police department the suburban town they didn't really have much i called the prosecutor's office you have a court file on this yeah can i borrow it yeah so i took it and i copied the whole thing to have in our system oh then about three weeks later you get a phone call from these book publishers. Hey, we saw you wrote that other book and it's doing pretty well. You interested in writing a true crime book for us? We're looking for older historical crime. You know, you haven't known any cool. cases like that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah, I did. <laughs> so they said, they sent me a form to fill out and as a proposal form, I filled it, I sent it up and they said, write the book. And so I did. You know, four years ago this week, I was finishing the editing in a condo in Maui. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Very yeah. cool. So best place for people to get them, go on uh, Amazon or uh, ChloydSteiger.com? Yeah, well, yeah, you can go to ChloydSteiger.com, but it'll just link you to Amazon. You can go to Amazon. It's in Barnes & Noble. It's on Walmart. Uh, you can go to Walmart.com or BarnesandNoble.com, any of those book places. You know. But Amazon's the easiest. It's in stores. I, somebody sent me a note the other day that I saw that I bought this book at the airport. And see, <laughs> I didn't know they sold it there. <laughs> My daughter yeah. sent me a picture one time of the serial killer book they're selling your book at costco (laughs) i said cool (laughs) that's awesome well i will i will certainly put a link in the show notes so people can pick up the book sounds like they're really popular and um they can get them right there so 
Cloyd, awesome interview, man. It was an honor to have you on. Thank you for coming on, brother. Yeah, anytime, man. Good luck with your podcast. I'm glad you're doing well. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to do the outro um, real quick. Can you hang on for just like two or three minutes? Sure. Great. The great Cloyd Steiger, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, man, what a career. Definitely feel like Cloyd could come on again. Uh, I know he's got a ton more stories. You could tell he could barely, there's so many good ones. He could barely pick the right ones that he wanted to say, uh, but they were fantastic. My goodness. This is the point in the show when I thank the Patreon sergeants, the sergeant level Patreons who keep the boat afloat. I truly, truly appreciate you. I'm talking about the great Andy Biggs, Greg Gadboy, Adam Mihal. The great Chris June, Gary Steiner, Jake Pinedo, John Shoemaker, the great Lauren Stimson, everybody, Lane Campbell, Seth Wright. Sorry, James. <clears throat> got a call. I got a cold. James Rose, Tony Fahey, the great Ben Peters, Braden Walker, Jason Lau, the great Mike Wynn, Sasha McNabb, Scott Minkler, Tammy Walsh holding it down to dispatch. William James Long, that's Deputy William James Long to you. Sean Clifford, Dennis Carrasquillo, Iceman from Motor Cop Chronicles, the great George Tessier, see you at church, brother. Nick Noose, Scott Young, the great Tom Connell, Wayne M. Miller, retired ATF and author. Dan Carlson from Burley Boards, everybody check him out. Doug and Kelly Newman, love you guys, see you at church. Elliot Sykes, Richard Tolls, keep on trucking, my man, be safe out there. Christian, Jace Crow, Brad Thompson, the great Kyle Roberts, everybody, Zach Haney, Nancy Hammond, ladies and gentlemen, and Clark Lockoff. Love you guys. I'm in love with you. It's okay if you don't reciprocate. I appreciate you and all the support you continue to give me. It's amazing. So thank you. And uh, that's it for this week. I'll see you next time.